Welcome to Made It with Connor Tompkins. I'm here with Daryl Werner. He is, you have probably done more for dogs than anyone I know. He started All Paws, which you may know. He also started Snap Interactive, which was a really, really big deal. I've never seen a chart go up like that like up and to the right. And essentially it's connecting like social apps that were up on the rise with like dating and like your love life. And so you've done a lot of really cool things. Going to have you on the Made It podcast. It's great to be here and let's focus on the dogs. Yeah, I think that's a good place to start. One of the things that I liked is that Daryl and I met through Post Exit Founders and you were probably one of the first people that I talked to. And you had a dog company and I also worked on uh, Embark, which is a dog genetics company, right? And so you had also All Paws, which is like helping match dogs to owners. So I thought that was a really cool kind of like line. Thank you. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. It yeah. was, um, I was really just looking for an excuse to pet a dog every now and then. So I figured even if I have to start a business around it, I, I will. And mission accomplished. How did it start? Did you just start taking pictures of really cute dogs and then like going to like people and being like, this dog will like, needs you and I, I don't so know. So I left uh, Snap Interactive, my prior company, right. and brought a young lady with me who had worked with me there. Yeah. And we raised a bunch of capital. Yeah. Um, we're in a fortunate position because people had done well with Snap. Yeah. And we were sitting in an office with, you know, seven figures in the bank account. Yeah. And absolutely no idea what we want to do. That's not how most of business. Right. Not, not your normal journey. Yeah. Most of the time you're like, we have no cash. We have all these dreams. This this was the opposite. You know, I, I should have enjoyed it while I <laughs> But, uh, and I remember her saying like, we, we need to do something. Yeah. I'm like, okay, you know, fair. Uh, we started writing ideas down on a piece of paper. Yeah. And I remember number one was match.com for pets. Okay. There was something around gifting, I, I, whatever it was, the top three. We did the old Amazon thing of writing a press release to kind of express the value proposition before we went to build it. Right. And, um, you know, I showed it to a couple of friends and they're like, the dog thing feels right for you. I'm like, what was the headline? Like help Fido find love? I think it was something to the effect of like, you know, uh, well, I think at the time we called it like pet match or something, but pet match launches to help you find your perfect pet or, you know, search 42 filters to find your perfect pet. When you say like matchmaking for dogs, I thought it was like, and obviously I know all paws, right? But I thought it was like, I have Fluffy and I want Fluffy to find a partner, you know? <laughs> And then like a breeding site, which kind of makes sense. Like, I feel like that should be a thing. It was Tinder for finding your next pet. Yes. And the dog is like, yes, no. But, but the humans do the swiping. Now, maybe, maybe soon we'll do the dogs. Hi there. This is Nate Houghton with the Made It Podcast. Wanted to let you know that this episode is supported by Rush Imhotep. Rush is a financial advisor with Northwestern Mutual. He's one of our preferred advisors that we like to connect people with. Specializes in working uh, with individuals with non-traditional career paths like entrepreneurs. If you want to learn more or connect with Rush, you should go to wealthwithrush.com. The link is in the episode bio below. Check it out. Let us know what you think. Hey, podcast listeners. This is Nate from the Made It Podcast. Wanted to reach out to any uh, founders, growth marketers, sales leaders listening. We've made a community just for you, and we want to invite you to join. We have growth playbooks for you to use instructional events a few dozen every month to learn how to use the latest technology, uh, even some free services that can be helpful to help your company grow. The first thousand people to join are free. We've created a link. You can click on it in the bio for this episode. We hope you'll join us over at our community. So you guys landed on this dog um, company idea. Yes. Do you remember what the headline was on your PR piece when you were talking to people about this? Tinder for finding your next pet. Okay, Cupid for finding your next pet. eHarmony for finding your next pet. Yeah. It was an online dating site. Everything we did as we built it, we were looking at dating sites, you know, never looking at pet sites. Well, you kind of had one with Snap Interactive. Exactly. There. So were you just leaning into your strength yes. there? Yeah. And, you know, things that worked when we sent out emails instead of, you know, hey, Connor, here's, you know, six women in your area we think you'll like. It's, hey, Connor, here's six golden retrievers <laughs> six in your area poodles. we think you'll you know, Or, <laughs> hey, Daryl, instead of, you know, here's a... Uh, you know, meet so-and-so, we think she's perfect for you. It's, you know, meet Kona, we think she's perfect for you. I like that. I, I oddly like that more. <laughs> so it was every aspect of it was dating. Did you ever combine any personality elements with the, like, finding the right dog? Like, would you survey them and be like, how active do you want to be? Yes. And, and then match you to that energy level for a dog? Yeah, we had dozens and dozens of search filters. Yeah. Activity level, temperament. Right. 
again, at, at heart, this was a dating site. Everything you would see on a dating site, except pets instead of people and, you know, dog characteristics instead of human character in some cases. I think it makes a lot of sense and it, and it did well. I think one thing that um, maybe to reverse pitch you on this is that, have you noticed that like sometimes people look like they're dogs? So maybe using AI, you scan their face and then you find them a dog that looks like them in their area. Let's do it. Yeah, I think this is like a print gold. <laughs> so there's uh, Snap Interactive. Um, Snap was a client of Support Ninja back in the day. So I thought that was kind of fun. You sent me a video from Bloomberg. And I thought that was awesome because it was talking about how Facebook was blowing up and how there's these applications being built on uh, inside platform. And you guys timed it perfectly. Like it was oddly serendipitous, right? And you just see a uh, snap, you just see like this like graph just shoot up into the right. Like one of the steepest curves I've ever seen on like a, on a graph. Um, can you tell me a little bit about Snap Interactive, what the premise was? And then I would love to hear about that moment. That was wild. Snap was kind of right place, right time. Yeah. It was originally an online dating site called IamFreeTonight.com. Premise was date by your schedule, who, what, when, you know, when are you free? It was targeted yeah. towards busy urban professionals. We spent a year, year and change building it out. And building dating sites are hard. There's you know, a lot of people go into it. They don't understand the economics. I don't know that we understood it perfectly at the time either. It's really expensive. And the, the only thing that matters is the size of your user base. So, you know, we were doing okay, but not great. And then Facebook opens up their app platform. This is 2007. So we build an app whose primary purpose is to drive traffic to the dating site. Yeah. And way outperformed expectations. Yeah. We sensed that there was a life-changing opportunity, pivoted on a dime to build entirely on Facebook, stop building I Am Free Tonight, never touched it again, launched a new app called Are You Interested? August, I believe August 14th, 2007. And in those days, it was kind of the wild, wild west. If, yeah. you know, before Facebook had a lot of rules, if you understood viral growth, you know, we never did anything shady, but, you know, Connor, you want to move up in search results, invite 20 of your friends. You want to yeah. see, you know, get better matches, invite 20 friends. Basically. I would do that. And millions of others did as well, thankfully. <laughs> I mean, this is how Morning Brew grew, right? Because they had that thing where it's like, invite 20 friends, you'll get a backpack. And then you have this newsletter thing. Yep. So that makes a lot of sense. So we would, you know, gate certain features behind needing to invite friends. Right. And um, we grew, you know hundreds of thousands, millions of users in the first few weeks, first few months, thing went, went nuts. We certainly weren't prepared for it. And we got a really quick lesson on scaling. We made it through. Obviously a lot don't make it through and a lot fall apart. Like when the app breaks, the site breaks, but we had to learn quickly how to scale a site from, you know, a hundred <laughs> users to a million users in like a minute and a half. And it, thing kept growing. I think we grew 12 consecutive quarters. We were publicly traded and which was an unconventional route. When did you become public? From the beginning. It wasn't an IPO, it was a self-registration. I have a law degree, I have a background in securities law. Uh -huh. So we were able to take the company public from the get-go, which we thought was a good idea. We thought it'd make it easier to raise friends and family money, give them, you know, That's liquidity. That's not the way most people go. <laughs> no, we, we have, we've never done things the normal way. Perhaps we should have. Yeah. Because it mostly sucked. We were on the bulletin board. We had this illiquid stock, basically couldn't trade. And no matter how well the company was doing, we couldn't raise money. A lot of VCs wouldn't touch us because we were publicly traded. We were doing several million a quarter in revenue, I think, at this point. We had a market cap of seven million. Thing doesn't trade. We get a call randomly from a Bloomberg reporter. And he's like, you guys seem like the best undiscovered story on Wall Street. You know, can I sit down with you? This is probably October of 2010-ish. So we have a long meeting with him. Seemingly goes well. Don't hear from him for two months. About mid-December, he calls us and he goes, do you work in a garage? And, huh? Like, yeah, do you work in a garage? Like, no, you've been to our office. You know where we work. It's like can do I need to work in a garage for this article? Like, is this uh, the story no, arc? No context, no anything. He's like, thank you. But a week later, all of a sudden, an article comes out in Bloomberg. And long article on us, all positive. Okay. 
there's a quote from Greg Blatt, who was the CEO of Match.com at the time. He's like, I'm not worried about are you interested? It's just a fun, flirty little app made by a bunch of guys who work in a garage. We have dozens of data scientists and blah, 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 blah. More importantly, thank you for the shout out. But what the shout out did, which changed the trajectory of the company, is we then appeared, that article appeared under the IAC ticker symbol. Okay. So we had this stock that never moved, that all of a sudden, because it's listed under IAC, it didn't take much to move it. People started buying it. And the thing was, you know, 14, 17 cents, whatever. Yeah. Right. First day goes up to 20 some odd cents. Second day goes up to 50 cents. Now keep in mind, the article comes out, I think it's December 23rd of 2010. So totally dead Christmas week. You know, interesting lesson. It goes against like every piece of advice of, you know, the best times to put out news or yeah. Tuesday morning, this. This is a completely dead week. Nobody's paying attention. We ended up benefiting from it because there wasn't a lot of other news going on. Yeah. So um, stock goes up, you know, 50 cents the next day, ultimately to like $2 and change within several days. Oh, Bloomberg TV starts covering the story. Yeah. And my favorite, I still remember one of the segments where she's like, you know, like breathlessly, we've been covering the story of Snap Interactive, the stock that's gone from 17 cents to $2 in a short period of time. You know, today on volume of 3 million shares, last week at this time it had, is this right? A hundred shares traded? <laughs> <laughs> and we're just watching this. It's totally surreal. And all of a sudden we're getting inundated with phone calls from investors, public company investors, et cetera. Yeah. We ended up uh, filtering everything out to our lawyer. Long story short, we ended up raising eight and a half million dollars at a $70 million valuation. Something like, I think it closed January 14th, January 17th. Okay. So this is all in a span of like three weeks. The wild part is nothing about the story changed. Nothing about the company changed. You guys are the same people and the same company, same, same company, product. Same revenue, same anything. It, Did you look like a genius for making your company public at first? Like, or... I think, I think that week we were a genius. That week you were a genius? Every other week it was like, what the F did we do? Like, yeah. You know, we're watching competitors. You know, Zeusk was an example that went crazy during that period. And they're all raising $40 million from VCs and we're stuck at the $7 million market cap and nobody would touch us. And then we have this week where like everyone's literally throwing money at us. It was, I mean, we did ultimately close the deal. Uh, we did like a two day road show and then people were, I don't know what the right term is, you know, making their offers and our bankers calling us like, you know, all right, they're in for 2 million, we're up to four, we're up That's to six. Insane. And, we're, up to, and, and we are actually like, you know what, can we slow this down a little bit? Like we don't want to dilute ourselves too much. I almost feel like this is like draft day. Like it was, it was an out of body experience. I mean, that's pretty remarkable. I, I just imagine you and Cliffy, are you drinking with mimosas and you're like, cheers? Or are you like, the world's going to end? We were <laughs> so money. exhausted. We were so exhausted from this. <laughs> like, take a stress nap. <laughs> I mean, I remember New Year's Eve sitting in the office meeting with the bankers, you know, till 6, 7 p.m., like constantly just texting my wife, like, sorry, I'll be home. I can't make it yet. I can't make yeah. it yet. And it's just, again, you know, with this dead company, dead from a, a stock perspective that no one would touch. And now suddenly they're throwing money at us and just like, you know, I guess like winning the lottery or something, our, our whole life changed overnight. Yeah. And we ended up raising that money, used it to actually build out a company, uh, you know, nice new office. It's tires. funny, you're working backwards. You're working, you went backwards, you, you or you started with the end, which is the IPO or the public offering. You had a company, it wasn't very big. You raised some money off of this news article. Then you went backwards and then you like built the company that warrants the valuation. Well said, yep. We kind of backed into the valuation, so to speak. Um, yeah, and turned into a, a serious company, you know, pretty much overnight. Um, being public mostly sucks. Yeah. I wouldn't recommend it for most people. It's a pain in the ass to run a public company. Yeah. But for that period of time, it was a lot of fun. Only downside was all of our friends got to sell and make a fortune. We couldn't sell. And a lot of our friends didn't understand that, like, we didn't get to sell during that period and assumed that we had made, like, millions and millions of dollars that we didn't make. Walk me through this really quick. Um, okay. Why can't you sell? Because as insiders, you're not allowed to trade on material non-public information. Mm -hmm. Combine that with the fact that we're particularly conservative when it comes to that stuff and didn't want to get in trouble. We had a stock that just went up from you know 14 cents to at, at a high $4 and change almost overnight. Right. So we just didn't want to risk selling and 
Yeah. Well, there's a lockout period when you initially go public, right? So can you help me understand, like, you guys have already been public for a long time. Yes. Did you want not want to spook investors? Did you not want to? It's the fact that you can't trade on material non-public information. So, and you're over the, the catch 22 is as a CEO or, or founder, you're always in possession of material non-public information. Yeah. You're like, so, this is my company. What a lot of people do is we'll, they'll create a memory survey. I think it's called a 10B5-1 plan. Right. And so where, they say that we're going to execute on this at this ex- time. Right. Did you guys do that? No. Do you wish you did? 100%. Okie dokie. <laughs> Actually, I should say about 5 million percent. <laughs> 5 million percent. That is perfectly fair. <laughs> yes. So, um, <laughs> yeah, we, we did not make the same money that a lot of others did, but assume that we did, yeah. which was always fun. That's a harder thing whenever people assume, like they see yes. this persona and they're like, they, it's true for most founders because most cap tables for most companies are not public information, right? And so you can have a wildly successful companies and either you raise too much money there's a lot, or uh, the cap table is different between partners. And so there's a whole bunch of different circumstances where like what is presented on the outside might not be what's happening for you in your reality. Correct. And you're, uh, you're experiencing this pretty extremely. Um, and so everyone is expecting you to buy dinner and buy drinks at the bar. With, with my, my paper fortune. You're like, hey, bartender, I'm, I'm rich on I, paper. I got some stuff. Can I pay in options? Like I owe you, yeah. I mean, I remember one of my friends you know, basically accusing me of calling, uh, accusing me of being a liar when I said that I, I didn't make money off of that. Oh, geez. And he kind of looked, I'm like, why would I lie to you and say that I'm poor? Like most people brag about being richer than they are. Yeah. Not poor. And he just, he couldn't comprehend that oh. I didn't make any money out of that. You know, it didn't end up selling anything until many years later. Can you walk me through the exit? Because that's a very unique exit. And I'm sure that there's a lot of lessons learned on the M&A side. Ultimately, I left in early 2013 to start something new, to start All Pause. Yeah. Uh, company was subsequently acquired well after I left. Don't have, you know, too much insight into the exit process there. Yeah. It was past me. You ended up selling All Pause. So you left, started All Pause. Yes. You had a co-founder. No. Oh, I so, you, solo founder. Solo founder. I thought you had a person with your from your previous venture, and she, you guys were coming up with lots of na- yeah, ideas. Yeah, she joined and, me, but not not quite oh, at a founder level. Gotcha, gotcha. And so you guys have this company, and you're you're making these matches between canine and and human. These uh these uh kind of uh love relationships yes. that are going to be in place for years to come. You start all pause, and you end up exiting all pause. Who did you sell to? PetSmart. And what was that like? I found it fascinating from an intellectual perspective. Yeah. You know, if most of my life didn't depend on the deal closing, yeah. I would have absolutely loved it. You know, what was interesting, I mean, All Pause was not a huge company. We were three, three and a half employees. We were doing you know, seven figures in revenue. We were operating out of a one-room office in New York City in a shared service space. I have a law degree. I'm very detail-oriented. I'm organized. I was blown away by the due diligence process. You're selling to a major company. And the difference between like buying a company on a, like a 7BA or a, a, a small business loan versus selling to a major company that has requirements on to their sh- shareholders about the companies that they acquire is completely different. I was thrilled. We got multiple bidders well above my minimum target price. Right. So from that standpoint, like, great, this is going to close or this is going to, you know, get to a letter of intent stage at an amount I'm really happy with. So that was great. The due diligence process, yeah. I mean, I remember they at one point asked for every agreement the company had ever entered into. I remember that question, not a fun question. Well, the best part, I I don't know about in your case. In our case, you know, I handed them all of our agreements, which weren't a ton, they were kept in a drawer. And they're like- Like a physical, it was a physical stack. (laughs) It literally was, and they're like, no, every agreement. And I'm like, what do you mean? They're like, so long story Vendors, short, employee pretty agreements. much anytime you check the terms of use, I agree to the terms of use box. Like when you sign up for Gmail. Oh yeah. I forgot about that. Yeah. You have to do that too. And I'm like, are you effing kidding me? Oh jeez. And I'm, I'm like, you gotta, we ultimately ag- agreed we arrived at a place where I was willing to represent that the sum total, if I turned over our password doc, the sum total of these relationships was that we had signed up on their website and there was absolutely no other relationship. And like, they ultimately were okay with it. But I, the fact that this was like a thing for a bunch of days, 
you know, or one one developer who worked on one piece of code two years earlier. Yeah, who I didn't even know where he was. They're like, we don't love his agreement. So that kind of stuff. I think I might have blacked out whenever they asked me about this, and I remember like we had to pull up a spreadsheet and we listed out every single software that we had, right? And then we listed out every single like. Uh, user credential, number of licenses, and then we had to find the contract. And then we're checking our email addresses to try to find when they sent us this contract. Most sometimes they didn't send you the contract. You're like, how material is this? But this is some of the stuff that you have to do whenever you sell a business to a uh, private equity firm or a bigger company. It's a lot. Yeah. I mean, they had a serious, they brought in a separate outside counsel, you know, top yeah. law firm for this in addition to their own, in addition to their in-house general counsel. Were they taking some of the cost of the due diligence out of the sale price? No. Oh, that's good. Okay, that's a win. No, no, no. <laughs> Thankfully, no. Yeah, we're going to spend uh, this much on your company, but we're going to spend most of it on due diligence. That, that's what fast, I'm like, I feel like you're spending more than the cost of the company on the due diligence. Most likely, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Ernst & Young and PwC and, and all these uh, companies that are working on your technical due diligence, your contractors, they're, the, they're like walking away and they're, they're really happy. That was another, I remember them asking for audited financials. I'm like, we have like six line items a month. You know? <laughs> Here's my server cost. <laughs> it's like literally like these are our 10 bills that we pay every month. I feel like they kind of did you dirty. I feel like they probably could have simplified that one a little bit for you. The funny thing is the guy who I ended up being best friends with there was the the associate general counsel who was the lead guy on the deal. Yeah. And he ended up being like the nicest guy and we, we stayed friendly afterwards. And you know, it's like kind of have to do that, blah, blah, blah. But what year was this when you, you closed? We sold October of 2016. Okay. Stayed with them for a year. So through October 2017. Right. Transitioning the business. Yeah. Which basically meant I did the same thing I did previously for 11 and a half months <laughs> until two weeks late, it left. It was like, oh, we got to do something here. Let's uh, find yeah. someone. What did you do after that? Did you take a, uh, some time to rest? Did you go to Palau? Where did you, what happened? Uh, if, you ask, you... if you ask my wife, I took way too much time to rest. Yeah. I took about two, two and a half years off after that. Yeah. Um, you know, I dabbled in a few things, you know, you, you've been through similar. I didn't know what I wanted to do at that point. I, I still had, don't know what I want to do. <laughs> I, yeah, I say, I don't know what I want to do when I grow up. We spend um, most of our time talking about what we want to be when we grow up. <laughs> but I really, you know, I had money in my pocket. I suddenly, I felt like this snap kind of rolled into all pause. So in a way it was, you know, like a 10 year journey and it all ended. And I was just like, I don't know what to do with myself now. So, you know, we bought a house. So I was like, okay, cool. I can be home for the furniture delivery. We had recently gotten a dog so I can walk the dog and watched a lot of TV. You know, one of my friends is like, I was always, always wanted to go into business with you. I'm like, okay, cool. And you know, we kind of dabbled at some stuff, but the passion wasn't there. The drive wasn't there. Um, this might be cheesy, but I want to like send a, I don't know if it's a gift basket or a trophy. I like, if, if you're an entrepreneur and you sell your business, like, and you reach out to me, I will send you a physical trophy because I feel like some people like they sell a business and nothing happens. Well, you have to reach out to me. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like it's so anticlimactic. And like for a lot of people, it's a hard transition and they don't know what they're supposed to do next. And it would be nice to be like, like with YouTube, you have a hundred thousand subscribers and you get a play button thing. And it's like, yeah, I, I get the participation profi trophy thing. Like not everyone should get one, but if you built a company, I want, a trophy is a, an example, but I want that should be celebrated. That should be like, let me throw like a an event in the city and and gather some friends or some other entrepreneurs together and let's have a drink. Like that needs to happen. I agree, and it's t again. I don't know. I'm curious about with your circle. You know, you also kind of don't want to brag or raise too much attention to the fact that you just got a big payday. Yeah. And like a lot of my world is not startup world, so didn't necessarily mean the same thing to them it's fine when we sold the company it um you're waiting for like the check to clear or the wire to go the through wire, yep. and that's a weird moment and then like i got home and like my wife like in the span of like five minutes figured out how to spend everything 
Like she had a spreadsheet. They have that ability, don't they? It was amazing. And she was like, here's all our family members. Here's the ones that are still in college. And like, it's like, we, we, we. And I'm like, it took like seven years and you just spent seven minutes and you figured it out. That's fantastic. I'm like, let's take it slow. And I think that there's something around like getting used to money and yeah. getting more comfortable, like after you sell your business around, uh, how do you adjust? I, I remember that moment though. It was, I mean, you know, you work on a deal for months and it, it's all consuming. Yeah. And then I remember the email coming across, you know, guys, the wire has been, you know, been released. Yeah. And check the bank account and it hit. Wow. Now, now what? Yeah. And it was like the middle of a weekday. You know, my, yeah. my wife was at work. Yeah. I'm just sitting in my apartment by myself yeah. with my dog. You know, I just had a nice sizable wire hit my account. It's like, well, I feel like I'm supposed to be doing something. I don't know what. What do I do? There, there has to be a better way. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I was at Chase Bank and they were trying to sell me on a bunch of different products. Oh, so yeah, that's I, not the best I, I, way to go. <laughs> immediately it's... uh you know, here, here's our wealth advisor, here's our this, our private client guy. Yeah, I've, I've never felt so loved by a bank. <laughs> I say it's hard to feel loved by certain banks. <laughs> you are messing around with a bunch of different um, ideas that you think are growing and, and are scaling. And one is focusing on, on this influencer economy. Yes. And we've had some guests on the podcast that talk about like how this influencer space, there's a little bit of a gap between um, the value that these influencers bring to the brand and how much they're able to capture on that value. And there's also a little bit of a gap as far as harder for brands to engage with influencers. Yep. Um, so what are your thoughts? What's exciting about this? First of all, super bullish on the creator economy, on influencer marketing, et cetera, et cetera. I think the name of the game going forward is distribution. And I think that the nature of audiences has changed. You know, it used to be like some major celebrity holds up a water bottle, like here, buy this. Everyone runs a button. Now it's, you know, the, the girl on TikTok who has a hundred thousand followers and showing her, you know, get ready routine and her, yeah. her skin cream that made her acne disappear that you relate to, you know, they're relatable, they're authentic. Yeah. So I think that excites me in general. I think that's where the world is going. Yeah. You know, as I, I had no previous deep experience in this space, and as I've been diving in, what's been exciting to me is almost every hypothesis I had was wrong. I, the space is so much earlier than I thought. There's so much more opportunity than I thought. You know, we, uh, I'm working with someone on this and partner. We interviewed at this point, probably interviewed like 60 models, influencers, creators. I just assume, oh, you know, they're all assigned to big agencies who do all their brand deals and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And it's not the case in a lot of, particularly anything below like the top tier influencers. What would you consider to be top tier? Probably 10 million and up. We talked to a kid who has 5 million followers. He's his own agent. He does his own brand deals. We have an onboarding form. We're informing the community of these people and yeah. they have like 80 so far. And we asked them, what are their rates? for you know an instagram post or a story or a reel even just that they're so all over the place i mean granted you know different people have different engagement and different niches etc but they're so all over the place and there's so little correlation like one might say that to do a reel or to do uh you know a post i charge x to do a post in a story i charge 2x another might say i charge 5x another might i don't say even know I what the standard is like when I, I don't think they do either. That's I was asked to do like a brief for influencers and I'm like, I give you five hundred dollars and you give me something hopefully, please. Like pretty please. <laughs> That's what's been exciting and challenging is like everything is still on the table. Every opportunity is still available. We've had a hard time sorting through. Um this is an interesting data set. So like are you sending them a type form and they fill this out? So for what I just described, yes, but initially it was a lot of just interviews. It was getting them on calls. Essentially, you know, same way I would interview a user or a potential customer, right. ask them a lot of questions to input them into our, our community. Yes, we're using a, some, or a type form type thing. I think that would be very interesting data to see, like just to see the range as far as like, here's the number of followers that you have. Here's how big the community is that you engage with. Here's the engagement level. And then here's how much you're asking for. Because anytime that there's like an untapped or undeveloped market, that type of data is like incredibly interesting. Yeah. So how far along is this idea and what do you think comes next? Still very early. Uh, we've been onboarding creators, models, influencers into a community. We're up okay. to about 80 with 
30 some odd million followers between them, yeah. you know, another 100 or so with up to like 90 million followers in the pipeline and then access to a bunch more. Yeah. We're really trying to figure out what to do with them. Uh, we don't want to be a traditional agency. Right. We don't want to do brand deals. What we're actually seeing a lot of is influencers, models, creators, et cetera, who want to launch brands or want to start businesses and don't know how. Oh, they want to do their own from zero to one. What's resonating with them really is the what's next question. Brand deals are inconsistent. They know if they're a model, their shelf life might be limited. Right. Start the, or they're a slave to the algorithm. It doesn't matter what platform you're on, you know, Twitter, LinkedIn, t TikTok, Instagram, right. the algorithm is always screwing you, which, you know, makes sense. So the idea of being able to build their, build an audience off platform, own their audience, monetize off platform, yeah. and in a lot of cases, you know, actually launch a brand or a business is really interesting to them. We're just trying to figure out how to manage it with, you know, bootstrapping and two people. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a limited bandwidth there. For yes. Sure. I'm not sure if it looks like, do you partner with like a distillery and you're like, Everyone gets a tequila brand, you know, like, and you put a label on it, or is it more like you go to, um, like that conference in Shenzhen where they have like every single manufacturer that's ever been on Alibaba, AliExpress, Timu, and Amazon, and you walk around with these influencers and you're like, pick your product, you know, and, and go from there. I, I don't know what that looks we're, like. We're figuring it out. I'm figuring it out right now. Are you yeah. focusing mostly on fashion? Not particularly. Okay, so it's um, all different types of people. Yeah, I mean, we're seeing people want to do skincare, people who want to do certainly fashion, um, right. supplements. Supplements. They all want to do it. I don't, not all, but you know, some more seriously than others. Yeah. A lot of them just don't have the knowledge, experience. They kind of know. I mean, one of my initial questions when I was interviewing them is like, do you feel like there are monetization opportunities that you're not taking advantage? advantage of. And the answer was always yes, but I don't know what they are. I don't know how to go about them. Yeah. And now this has kind of been distilled into this what's next, you know, solving the what's next challenge, owning your audience off platform. Making, helping them make their own product or service from scratch sounds incredibly difficult. Yes. Like that sounds like yes. you're just spinning up constant businesses with people that have varying degrees of of success. Does it make sense to like work with pre-existing people? We're exploring that, you know, I, again, it's limited bandwidth, so we can't do many. Yeah. Beauty is they have the distribution figured out, you know, yeah. the, the right ones, you know, if you ever, the, but whether it's an engaged audience of 200,000 or an audience of 5 million, yeah. whatever it is, they've saw, I mean, the, the CPA should be zero initially and they've solved the distribution question, which you know, for the rest of us is what we always struggle with. Like, how are we going to get our product into the hands of users? They have people who are lined up, you know, to buy, engage with whatever, whatever they want to do. So that, that also is what's exciting to me is they have what I always had to build from scratch. It's just sitting there and it's largely untapped. With this new business and some of the things that you've learned in the past, what are some things that you're going to do with this one that you didn't do with all pause and you didn't do with snap? I mean, I've learned so many lessons along the way that I'd like to think I'm implementing as we go. I think you can hear right now. I'm, we're trying to figure out product market fit, trying to figure out the right opportunities, trying to prioritize. I mean, I think it's all reflected in the things I'm doing that I probably take for granted. Yeah. You know, in the past I've gotten distracted by shiny objects. You know, many, many shiny objects. Ironically, a lot of them have involved celebrities, you know, with, yeah. with the dating site, like Ben Stiller's people contacted us, wanted us to uh, design a site to appear in their movie oh, for like a like month. You know, Zoolander? Was, <laughs> sadly, no. Something, something went straight to video. Oh, okay. So for like a month, that's all we focused on. And we learned a lesson like, okay, that accomplished nothing, didn't move the business forward. Yeah. So, you know, I think now it's reflected in just my actions, just knowing that you need to ruthlessly prioritize. You need to identify the one, two or three things that move the business forward. Yeah. You need to figure out how to get to product market fit, know when you have it, know when you don't, and just all of those things. If, if and when we get to the point, I've learned a shit ton about hiring and- <laughs> Which uh, is arguably one of the most important things yeah. that we can possibly do. I'll add one more. I think another thing I've learned over the years is the ability to communicate effectively. Yeah which I think is a superpower, the ability to have tough conversations and be candid and direct. And, you know, I didn't have that when we started and most people never have that. 
So learning that I think has made a huge difference in my career. That's fantastic. Where should people go to find you, Daryl? Twitter is at DarylLearner.com. I'm sorry, at Daryl Lerner. Um, my website is at Dar is DarylLearner.com. I'm on LinkedIn. My Instagram is dlearner2112. I assume we'll have uh, influencers that will be popping in and out of your, yes. your feeds, and then it'll, it'll go from there. Yes. Well, I, I joke that I have now on Instagram as a, real, as a result of this, the highest model to follower ratio of <laughs> any non-model in the world, because I got like 300 followers on Instagram, about like 30 of which are models. That's, so. that's definitely not my demographic on my feed not uh, the what i expected to be at either at some point you need to combine influencers with dogs and uh your platform can be like dogs dog influencers maybe i'm down for anything dog related i think it's a big deal all right guys that's the pod cheers that wraps up today's episode for more inspiring stories and valuable lessons from successful entrepreneurs be sure to listen and subscribe wherever you get podcasts thanks for listening until next time keep pushing boundaries and writing your next chapter